Good morning, media friends, those following us on the radio and the, and the uh, computer, the live stream. It's a wonderful thing, wonderful thing to join with you. Let's get started. Oh, I should say, there's going to be doing things a little differently. If you look at your hard copies, if you've got a hard copy on page 9, <clears throat> that today, always on the third Sunday of the month, we do what we call a fellowship Sunday and just the excuse. You'll see the goodies and the coffee out there and whatever. Just an excuse to, to stop and visit for a little while, for a few minutes after church and just visit with some folks you may not have seen for a while, but we're going to do that with the kids as well. Uh, the kids going downstairs uh, in the basement for that fellowship. And, and so when you see that little blurb there right after the blessing, skedaddle your, your little ones downstairs and, and they'll do their thing downstairs and we'll do our things upstairs and go that way. Okay? Just so you know what's going on. All right. Let's get started with our worship this morning. Would you grab a hymnal, please, and let's sing our first hymn. That's hymn 363. Would you please stand? Dear members and friends of St. Paul's, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Thank you so much. As children of God, we join in worshiping the Lord our Savior and give thanks for the opportunity and blessings of Christian education which include our Sunday school, Christian day school, high school, college, and seminary opportunities. O oh Lord, you have blessed our congregation through the gifts and service of all kinds of Christian education. You bless our congregation with Christian education through faithful families at home, and through our brothers and sisters through faith. As I live my life, I have often forgotten about the vital importance of regular education in your grace and word throughout my life. 
Too often we have ignored and neglected your word in both our public and private worship lives. I humbly come to you this morning, confessing my disobedience to your holy laws. Forgive my rebellious and selfish nature, my many weaknesses and my lack of thankfulness. Take away my sins for Jesus' sake and help me to do what is right in your eyes. Lord, have mercy. God, our Lord, is infinitely gracious and merciful. He has removed our sins through the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ. Through his gift of repentant faith, he has adopted us as his children. Let's sing praises and rejoice over this grace now in this service, but let's also show our thanks and live our lives in the peace of forgiveness so that others around us may hear, believe, and be saved as well. In the peace of God's forgiveness to us, we thank and praise the Lord. Please be seated. Let's give our attention to the gifts.
Thanks, young Christians, for sharing your talents, your time with the rest of us. I, we certainly appreciate Mr. Brown, the teachers, spending time learning a song like that. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. That The context for this lesson is that the Israelites have just finished their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They are poised. They are on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, Moses, Joshua, technically, is about to lead them across the Jordan River to start conquering the promised land of Canaan. And the whole book of Deuteronomy, Moses spends reminding the Israelites of the commands that God gave them 40 years prior to this at Mount Sinai. He's saying, don't forget, when you get into that promised land, don't forget all these commands, all these uh, laws that the good Lord is giving you to, to use in the, in the promised land. Moses wasn't going to be following with them. He disobeyed. He could not cross over with them into the promised land. And it's the very last line of our scripture lesson that says, yeah, this is a good reminder for the Israelites, for Moses, but then also for us, right? Teaching these laws, teaching these truths of God's holy word from generation to generation, right? You could say from Moses all the way till now, and all the way from now until the good Lord comes in and comes on a judgment day. So a good reminder for us that Moses gives in Deuteronomy chapter 4. He says, Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. Baal is, a, is an idol, a false god. But all of you who hold fast to the Lord, your God, are still alive today. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. It's the end of our first lesson. Let's join in a verse from hymn 735. <laughs> The second lesson today comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, where Jesus very clearly shows his, I don't know if you could say priority, but a very high importance that Jesus gives to teaching, that Jesus and his disciples are going around the, the, the Palestine, the, the country of Israel, and young parents are bringing their kids to Jesus to bless them, and, and the, the disciples think they're doing Jesus a favor, that this rabbi, this teacher, 
they think, has more important things to do than spend time with all these little kids. And Jesus wags his finger at the disciples. He chews them out, quite honestly, and says, no, 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 the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The importance, the importance that we have teaching God's truths from generation to generation certainly is repeated by our Savior Jesus. This morning we read Mark 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. The end of our gospel lesson. to come up to the front. Parents, use your good judgment on whether or not they should come. If you want to come up with them, you're more than welcome to join them. Good morning, everybody. Busy day for some of you, up and back and up and back again. Thanks for coming up again. Uh, I brought something along with you this morning. I want to see if you know what it is. It's in my hands here. Does anyone know what this is? A couple hands. And I'll be honest, the kids who I thought were going to know what it was this morning. Anybody? Jackson, you know what this is? It's a compass. And it's not just any compass. It is an orienteering compass. Anyone heard of orienteering before? No. <coughs> It's a combination of using a map and a compass. You see it's got these angles on it, so you can actually see what direction you're going. What does a compass do? Be somebody who didn't know it was a compass. What does a compass do? Daniel. Go east, west, south, north. Yeah, it tells you what direction you're facing, right? Does anyone know which way north is? I'm going to cover it up for a second. Can you point north right now? Do you know which way north is? We can use our, our fancy schmancy compass to tell us. So if you look, I have to hold it level, but if you look, the, point, the direction the red arrow is pointing, that's north. Which way is north? It's behind me. Yep, that's north. Sometimes I need a compass because I'm not very good at directions. So you use a compass to tell you which direction you're facing, and sometimes even to tell you which way you're going. Did you know you have a few compasses in your life? Yes, you did. <laughs> Maybe it's not a handheld compass like this, but, but I'm actually talking about some different compasses. You have something called parents. 
You ever thought of your parents like compasses before? Sometimes, not really. Well, your parents are kind of like compasses because they tell you which way to go, right? And the most important direction they point, they don't point you north. They don't say, that way is north, face that direction. Where do you think their compass is pointing you to? It's another thing that's right behind me, actually. Nora. They're pointing you to Jesus. Your parents are kind of like a compass that points you to Jesus. In, in our sermon for today, you're going to hear a Bible verse. And maybe you've heard it before. It comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 22. And it's verse 6. It says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. How many of you think uh, you could figure out your way to school in the morning without using a map or a phone or anything fancy like that? You just know how to get to school in the morning. Most of you, that's good. Some of you don't yet. Oh boy, we've got to work on that. Over time, you need to use these things like a compass or like you probably just tell your mom or dad's phone, hey Siri, take me to school, right? You could do that. It's kind of cheating. But over time, you just kind of learn, don't you? Well, your parents are also kind of like that compass that over time, they tell you, here's where you should go. Here's the direction you should travel in. But after a while, do you need that direction anymore? No, because you know, where, is, where should I be pointed in my life? I should be pointed at Jesus, right? That's the beautiful thing that we're going to celebrate this week in Christian Education Week, that your, your parents are those compasses, but, but a lot of you, a lot of you up here today also attend our school at St. Paul's Lutheran School, right? And our school helps your parents in that. Our school acts as a compass for you as well and says, hey, point yourself toward Jesus. He's the greatest destination you could ever travel toward, right? Yeah. Let's pray about that this morning, should we? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for putting people in our lives, and especially those, those wonderful parents that we have, uh, and not just any parents, but Christian parents, Christian parents that, <clears throat> excuse me, that point us toward you, uh, the greatest destination we could possibly have. Uh, we ask, us to help us, ask you to help us stay focused on you, uh, to keep you as our one true destination for the rest of our lives and into eternity. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming up here this morning. God bless the rest of your day. While they are taking their seats, would we all stand and let's join together as we confess our Christian faith, making it a little easier for them to get in and out. I'm on the middle of page five. In a world that has difficulty believing in the one true God taught about in the Bible, but is so ready to believe that our universe happened by some accident or blind chance, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe I was created by and am provided for by my gracious God who is revealed in the Bible. In a society that often teaches that Jesus was just a great human teacher, a wise prophet, and the greatest example, what do you believe makes Jesus so important? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe God the Son, Jesus, redeemed me from my sin through his holy life, innocent death, and glorious resurrection. Those who refuse to trust the Lord for eternal salvation are without hope. What do you believe gives you hope, both now in this life and for eternity? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe the Holy Spirit created and strengthens my saving faith, which gives me the certain hope of my eternal life in heaven. I believe my triune God 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has accomplished everything for my salvation. Please be seated. Let's join in our second hymn here this morning, hymn 511. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Your friends, fellow educators, it's amazing to me when I walk through a mall and you walk by a shoe store and you see, I'll say hundreds, that might be an exaggeration, hundreds of different shoes up on the wall. All kinds of different choices that you, we have when it comes to buying shoes, when it comes to buying athletic shoes. I remember as a kid getting a brand new pair of pro heads that had the little blue stripe on the bumper and getting all excited and saying, oh, I got some new, new tennis shoes. And you basically use those tennies for all kinds of different things. Everything that you were going to do, even going into grade school, you had basically the same shoes to play whatever game you were playing. 
was when I was getting older in grade school that you started getting specialized, right? Oh, basketball season's coming up. I remember very clearly, said, oh, that'd be so cool to get some Puma shoes. That's the shoe that Clyde Frazier wore, right? Clyde Frazier, the NBA guy, and you get a little older and say, oh, be great to have some Converse All-Stars like Julius Irving, Dr. J wears, you know? You look at the olden days and, and Chuck Taylor Converse All-Stars, that the, the canvas shoes that you wore in order to play basketball. But things got more specialized. If you're playing basketball, you had to buy basketball shoes. If you're gonna play volleyball, you gotta buy volleyball shoes. If you're gonna go run, you gotta buy running shoes. All kinds of different specialty shoes to fit whatever you're doing. And I get it, I get it. There's some technology that goes along with that shoe thing. There's a difference between running a marathon and playing racquetball, playing basketball, how you use those shoes, how you use your body to play that or that game. There are differences and there's a reason to have different shoes. But it was in the mid 80s, I think 1986, when Nike, the shoe company, came out with a new kind of a shoe, Air Trainer One. It was a cross trainer. This was a type of shoe that you could use for all kinds of different things. It didn't need to have a, a specialty shoe to play this or to play that. That if you buy this kind of a shoe, this cross trainer one, you would cross train. You could go from playing this sport to that sport. Again, there's some wisdom to that, but a perfect shoe, there is not. But this whole picture of cross-training, when we look at the ways, the different ways that a shoe can be worn, certainly can't we apply that to God's Word and the way and the uses that God's Word has in our lives. That we can see that certainly God's Word guides us and directs us as we live our earthly lives and go through our daily, everyday routines. But way more importantly, don't we see this cross-training, the truths of God's Word, more importantly, carry over into our spiritual lives, hearing about Jesus Christ, hearing about the forgiveness of sins, hearing about the one and only way to eternal life. And as long as we live on this earth, no matter what earthly situation we are in, young, old, male, female, what have you, we have the wonderful truths of this word, the word of God, the cross-training that we have from God's word. That's our theme here this morning, cross-train for life. That this cross-training certainly applies to earthly families, but also very importantly, and thankfully, this cross-training applies to our spiritual family we call St. Paul's, the Christian church. As Mr. Markraft read before, the verses, verse, the words that we're going to meditate a little bit on this morning come from the Old Testament book written by wise King Solomon, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Uh, Solomon writes, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Very clearly, right from the get-go of creation, God establishes a family as a cornerstone, as a foundation for society. Right from the get-go in Genesis chapter 1, we read verses like this, in verses 27 and 28. God created man, mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. As well as the aspect of husband and wife leaving father and mother, going to start your own family, this and that, the foundation of society, a foundation that certainly was created in the sinless creation that God made, but it's a foundation that God continues even after the fall, even after mankind, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, a foundation a cornerstone that very much applies to us today. Can't we say, as the family goes, as the family unit goes of a country, so goes its society? That when that family unit disappears and erodes, it doesn't take too long for that society, for that nation to erode as well. And on the surface, somebody can look at Proverbs 22 and focus attention on that first word, train, train a child in the way he should go. And sometimes we can look at that only superficially train. You think about all the training that parents we do, 
right? Right from the get-go of this or that child being born, don't we start training? I think very early in life of the joys that there are in a house when that child is potty trained for the first time and say, oh, no more diapers. I'm the, my child is potty trained. But how about the training that goes along of mothers and fathers training, teaching about colors, training, teaching about numbers, how to count, the alphabet. Isn't there a progression of training that goes on, educating that goes on in the earthly sense? Training that goes and says, knives are sharp. Don't play with knives. You could hurt yourselves. Training that goes on in that same kitchen. Stoves get hot. Don't put your hand on a burner. You can hurt yourself. All kinds of training that goes on. But I would say that as important as that training is, this is not the training that Solomon had in mind. It's not the training when in the New Testament, St. Paul gets much more specific about this training. Because as important as it is, don't cut your finger, don't cut your hand on that sharp knife. Solomon and the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 talks about a much more responsible, a much more important responsibility for us as parents, as Christian family, the training in our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We don't use that word exasperate very often, but I would use a synonymous phrase of saying, don't drive your kids nuts. Don't drive your kids to wit's end over too high of expectations. I can think of myself in examples of saying, if I am, was a mediocre athlete and I want my child, I want my son, my daughter to be a better athlete than I was, that it can be a very nasty temptation for, for me to exasperate my child, to drive my child nuts by having too high expectations. You've got to be the starting quarterback. You've got to be the starting outside hitter. You've got to get straight A's. And if you don't, you're in trouble to exasperate my children. And by all means, and part of this training and education, right, is encouraging, training our children to use their gifts and their God-given talents to the best of their abilities. Okay, I, I completely agree. Let's encourage Let's train for them to do that. But if my child is the second string left tackle on the football team, does that really make that big of a difference? If my child is not on the starting lineup for the volleyball team, is that really that big of a difference? If my child works as hard as he or she can and gets straight B's instead of straight A's, don't we thank God? Don't we thank God for those gifts and talents and abilities. Fathers, parents, don't exasperate your children. Instead, what's the way more important thing for us as parents, as family members, to remember? Don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Even if my child is the starting star quarterback or the starting star outside hitter or gets straight A's and gets an academic scholarship to an Ivy League school out east, in and of themselves, those gifts and abilities have got absolutely nothing to do with salvation, have got nothing to do with the forgiveness of sins. And so when we think back to when the good Lord blesses us with that gift of a child, slash children. What is the number one prayer of Christian parents? Not necessarily to be the starting quarterback, but that number one prayer is for that gift of faith. The number one prayer is for that child to reach eternal life in heaven. And so this is where we look at this privilege, the responsibility of Christian education. And maybe formally we think about that, that building across the street and say, look at all the teachers and the classrooms and all this educating that goes on in a school. But doesn't that educating, that education, really start with mom and dad, with parents, 
with family, that earthly family. Again, the training that takes place very early, that while they're learning letters and alphabets and colors and this and that, what a wonderful thing to do that training as parents and teaching a song, Jesus loves me, this I know. How about the training that goes about teaching and reading through Bible stories before going to bed at bedtime? How about the training that goes on at church? I think of young families in the back. Sometimes a young parent will say, sorry, pastor, so much noise in church. Sorry this morning. Oh, sorry. I say, what? what a wonderful sound, right? What a wonderful sound to have little voices, even if they're a little loud and crying. What a wonderful thing to have those little voices in church. That's part of training. That's part of training our children to grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And sometimes we can think, well, I'm separated. I'm, I'm removed from that whole reality by now. I'm, I'm, I'm advanced in years. I'm getting older. My kids are way out of school. I'm a grandpa. I'm a great grandma. I got nothing to do with school anymore. How can I have a part in Christian education anymore? This is where I would say, I think of two sections in the New Testament that talk about indirectly, not specifically right at Christian education and Christian parents and the blessing of a Christian family we call a congregation. But Paul writes a letter to his young co-worker Timothy and he refers to the huge importance of an extended immediate family. Okay, moms and dads, right? Aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, great grandmas and great grandpas. Paul writes to his young co-worker Timothy in his second letter. He says in, in chapter 1, verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. The huge example that teaching examples that we give as parents, as family members. Not just the direct teaching examples, right? Teaching our, our children one plus one, this is the color blue, this is, this is a knife, don't touch it, don't play with it. We could say those are direct teaching examples, but how about the indirect teaching we give as parents, as fellow Christians, as family and friends of young Christians? The indirect teaching that I give by the example, good examples that I give, God willing, but sad to say, how many bad examples don't I give? It's way easy for me to say to young ones, to my kids, do as I say, not as I do. Yet how about those examples that we give of what we do or don't do in our everyday lives? How do I talk? How do I speak? How do I talk about that person at work? How do I talk about this person at school? Is it a positive way or a negative way? What's my example that I'm giving of my, my, my Jesus life? Do we do Jesus at home? Do I do Jesus when we're on vacation? Do I de do Jesus and live Jesus throughout my life? People see that. It's not just a, a community thing, but how about that most direct teaching example to my children, to that family that's around me? God, forgive me for my failure to do that. And so we look at this huge importance, the blessing, the blessing that we have as Christians to live our lives as teaching examples for those around us. But then there's also, isn't there an extended family? This is, gets to the second point that I, I think of in the New Testament, that, well, okay, my kids are gone, and, and oh, what can I do? Well, one of the most important, simple things that you and I can do as Christians is pray, to pray for my grandkids, to pray for my nieces and nephews, to pray for those young Christians at school, to pray for teachers who are teaching my kids, to pray for the pastor who's teaching some catechism, to do some, some honest Christian praying for things like that. But what about also the very blunt realities of, of providing how something like that, a school, how something like that can operate that quite honestly, it takes time, it takes talents, and it takes treasures. It takes money, let's be honest. And pooling our resources and pooling all those talents and all that time and all those treasures 
To do what? Not to bring glory to ourselves and say, hey, community, look at us, look at what we're doing. But we're pooling all that time and talents and treasures to do what? To train, to teach, to focus on Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what was being done in the early New Testament church. Just very shortly after Jesus ascended into heaven, we see these early Christians in that New Testament church gathering their resources together to serve, to serve others in that family of believers. <clears throat> we read in Acts chapter 4, All the believers were, in, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now again, I'll be honest and say that's got nothing to do directly with a Christian day school or anything like that. But here is the reality. It says, here are those early Christians working together. And what an incredibly wonderful thing to see that continue to this very day. To see so many opportunities, so many different people with so many different gifts and talents and so much treasure doing what? Working together to grow in God's grace. Working together to share that grace with the children of, of our spiritual family we call St. Paul's and a spiritual family in our community. That we focus not necessarily just on reading, writing, and arithmetic, but the most important subject matter that is ever taught is looking at that truth of God's word, looking at what Jesus Christ has accomplished to forgive sins, to forgive the sins of the very young, to forgive the sins of the very old, to forgive the sins of everybody, turning to our Savior Jesus Christ and trusting and relying on him alone for the forgiveness of our sins. It's a responsibility, it's a privilege that, yeah, goes to fathers, parents, Scripture never says, parents, make sure you take your kids to a Lutheran elementary school. It never says, parents, make sure you take your kids to the pastor's confirmation class. It says, parents, fathers, it's your responsibility. But if God has given us tools to use in the process of doing that, let's take advantage of it. Let's take advantage of it and grow that faith which is started by that gift of baptism, that miraculous faith that turns to and trusts in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. So we can really look at God's word as those cross trainer shoes, right? Going back and forth, going from this sport to that sport. But instead of looking at sports, we say the cross training of God's word that says, boy, isn't that incredible guidance that God's word gives us as we live our daily lives. The direction, the peace, the comfort that we have. But then also, way more importantly, the direction that it gives to eternal life in heaven, direction for all sinners, young and old alike. Dear friends, let's continue. Let's continue to cross-train for life, continue to work together as the earthly families that we are and have, but also as the spiritual family we are through his gift of faith. Amen. Would you kindly stand? Now may the grace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach eternal life in heaven. Amen. We join in our meditation response there towards the bottom of page 6.
Please be seated. We're going to gather our thank offering at this time and sing our offering hymn, but just so you're aware, there is a typo uh, in there. It's not, if you're going to open up the hymnal and sing, sing the hymn from there, it's not hymn 588, it's hymn 488. Otherwise, we'll sing those two verses. Would those church council members who are here this morning, would you come forward at this time? gentlemen. Dear brothers, you have been elected in a regular meeting of this congregation to serve as members of the Church Council of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church of Norfolk, Nebraska. As such, you are to work with the called public minister of the word in the work and responsibility of carrying out our twofold purpose as a congregation in Christ's kingdom here on earth. As a family of believers, we strive to build up the faith of those people who are already members, as well as reaching out to the community around us with the only message that leads to eternal life. You are to assist in seeing that worship services be held regularly and conducted decently and in order. You are to lead this family of believers in testing and making sure that the gospel is preached and taught in accordance with all of Scripture. You are to assist in the necessary planning and provisions for the instruction of the young and that Christian discipline be maintained. You are to administer the civil and earthly affairs of the congregation by keeping its property in good order and providing for the financial support of our public gospel ministers. <clears throat> you are to assist in the care of the sick and the needy in the cultivation of peace, harmony, and love among the members as well as the public promotion and Christian reputation of our congregation in our community. As servants of Jesus himself and leaders in his church, you are also to set yourself and your household as examples of faithful Christian living, both to the congregation and the community at large. In order that the congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God and of this congregation, Will you diligently and faithfully use your God-given abilities to perform the duties of your office, conforming to the guidance and direction given in God's word, 
as well as to the constitution of this congregation. If you are willing to do this, answer yes with the help of God. Whereas you have publicly made this solemn promise, I command install you to the respective offices to which you have been elected. I pray that God guide and encourage and bless you as you dil diligently serve for the prosperity of this congregation and the church at large. Be assured that whoever is faithful in the use of God-given gifts and talents will be rewarded according to the all-knowing goodness of our Heavenly Father. This year, Mr. Joshua Calhoun serves on our trustees. John Koba has been elected and serving on our board of elders, as well as Joe Myers on the board of elders. Ron Kramer is our vice chairman and elder. Gary Tejan, see I do that all the time. Gary Tejan, Gary Tejan is the, the chairman of our board of elders. Joel Wiedemann. <laughs> Oh, pressure, pressure. Joel Wiedemann is our secretary, also serving on our board of elders. Dave Nelson serves on our board of el the elders. Fred Detterman will be serving on our board of trustees. Mike Mullen is serving on our board of trustees. Chris Price serving on our board of education. And Gary Bretschneider serving as our, our congregation's chairman. Brothers and sisters of St. Paul's, you have heard the solemn promises given by the men elected to serve on this congregation's church council. Therefore, I urge and command you to receive them as your leaders in our congregation. Respect and love them as Christian brothers, knowing and trusting that all the decisions they make and the actions taken are done in humble Christian love, first out of love and concern for God's holy word, and then also for our congregation. Members of St. Paul's, Will you support these leaders of our congregation not only through your prayers and trusting attitudes, but also through your willingness to help and serve our congregation in a variety of ways? If so, let's join together and answer, we will and we ask God to help us do this. We will and we ask God to help us do this. Will you patiently and lovingly trust that all decisions made and actions taken are not done in order to promote any vain or selfish ambition on any individual or the congregation's part? Will you patiently and lovingly trust that all decisions made and all actions taken are done in Christian love with the only goal of strengthening God's kingdom at large? If so, answer, we will and we ask God to help us do this. Since any congregation is made up of many individuals who have many different ideas and opinions on many different topics and decisions, for the greater good of Christ's church and for the sake of unity and peace, will you continue to support the ministry of this congregation through your prayers, good counsel, and offerings, so that we may continue to carry out Jesus' great commission of sharing the gospel? If so, answer, we will, and we ask God to help us do this. We will, and we ask God to help us do this. We pray. Gracious God, you are a constant witness of all our promises and commitments. We ask you to send an extra measure of loving dedication that comes through faith from the Holy Spirit on these men as they serve you and your earthly church. Give them a spirit of humble, unselfish, and dedicated service to you, so that our congregation may be built up in its faith and service. Keep the members of this church council in sincere harmony with their pastor and teachers as they work and serve together in the work to be done, so that your name is glorified and your kingdom grows here in Nebraska and throughout the world. Amen. Go then, brothers, as you have been called, and serve this congregation and your Lord to the best of your abilities. Be assured that your work and service to the Lord will bear fruit. The Lord's blessings to you. Thank you. We're on the bottom of page 7. Would you kindly stand and let's join in our responsive prayer. Page 7 going to the top of page 8. We pray. 
Dear Lord, our refuge and strength, we come before you in humility and gratitude, acknowledging your many blessings on our congregation and our various schools. We thank you for blessing us with faithful teachers, caring parents, and children eager to learn your word. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the teachers who have freely given of themselves so that your lambs, our children, may be nourished in the green pastures of your word. We also thank you for faithful parents who realize that their children's most important need is to know the saving truths of your word. Dear Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless all forms of our Christian education, starting with the personal lessons taught by all our Christian parents, to our worship services, to our Bible classes, to our Sunday school, to our day school, to our high schools, and to our Martin Luther College and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. Dear Lord, give us the desire to support the work of training our children through faithful parents, through our regular prayers and generous offerings. Continue to bless us with faithful teachers who teach our children with your word and by their Christian examples. May our congregation and all our schools be the Holy Spirit's workshop where future generations will learn to know and love their Savior and share him with others. May your peace, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our faith and hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Please be seated and we'll sing two verses of our hymn 514. Join together in our closing prayer, top of page 9. We pray. Dear Jesus, you have commanded us to feed your lambs with your precious gospel. Give wisdom and love to all the teachers in our congregation so that by word and example, our children learn to love you more and more. Lead us to support Christian education however it happens here at St. Paul's through our prayers, time, and offerings. Bless all our families and schools with both the earthly and spiritual blessings so that your saving gospel is heard and learned by us all. Amen. 
And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Kids who are going to go downstairs, please feel free to vamoose, and we'll see you later downstairs or upstairs. And let's close our service this morning. Two more verses of that same hymn we were just singing, hymn 514. Good morning again. Good morning. Thank you so much.